Hello, welcome to this video. We are picking up where we left off last week, which was uh, when we were talking about the progress so far in terms of how the trading system is making uh, predictions about what to buy. And as we had pointed out in the previous video, I was pretty happy about the decisions this thing was making. Uh, what we're looking at here is an example of predictions that this system made on a time frame that it was not trained on uh, for any symbol. And so over here we can see uh, it would have bought this little dip. It would have wanted to buy this little dip. Um, eh, <laughs> mixed feelings about that one, but it's in line with, uh, with how I kind of labeled this thing. Um, and then it would have tried to buy this dip. These over here, I'm going to ignore because this was these two data points are in the time frame of uh, of data that was um, that this system was trained on. Now, just to reiterate, uh, kind of the the strategy I'm taking here, even if I'm pr making predictions on this symbol BATUSD, the basic attention token. Um, I am not training on the data of this token itself. Um, if we train on this symbol, we take data from all the other symbols and we train on that data just to avoid overfitting, which technically isn't perfect because uh, because a lot of these symbols are very highly correlated. So you'll still get overfitting. You know, if you were to train the model on a time frame and then predict on that same time frame, you probably wouldn't be getting a real like a realistic idea of how this thing's going to perform in the wild. Instead, we want to then pull data, as I've done here, from the API uh, and cover a time frame that none of the data was trained on so we can see how this thing would make decisions, kind of simulate how this thing would, would act in real time. So all of this data is kind of, um, you know, pulled from the API after the fact, and then we say, okay, using the model that we had built and we pickled, uh, we stored it away. When we load that model up and we score data that's flowing in from the API, how would this thing be making decisions? So we're all caught up to where to what we had talked about last week, and we left off saying, okay, it's making some decent decisions in terms of buying, but what about selling? And so I haven't really gotten this into a great place in terms of selling yet. Uh, I've just been tweaking this for like a, a week or so, you know, in my spare time. But, uh, but we can see that I am avoiding buying, or not buying, I am avoiding selling here in a lot of places that uh, uh, that aren't the, the most optimal. And then it's saying, yeah, we would want to sell these, uh, these kind of spikes in price. And if we just take, you know, one example here, we look at this point and we come back, uh, we could see that the trading system, you know, in a vacuum of just looking at narrowing in on this time window, we would have bought here and then the system would have said, okay, once we hit this point up here, it's time to sell. Uh, now, keep in mind that, you know, these these local minima and local maxima, if you're considering all time, when you look at each of these points, of course, you would be benefiting from uh, hindsight, you know, everything hindsight <laughs> is 2020. Um, but the way that this is trained is it's only ever using data that happened before that point in time uh, to make a decision. And the only reason that it even knows that this is an attractive place to sell is that this smoothing function that's been applied to the price here, it's uh, when we see a local maximum, it, it isn't the actual local maximum of the closing price itself. It is a local maximum of a moving average or of, in this case, an exponentially weighted mean. And so that means that we sacrifice being able to pull the trigger at the actual peak. You know, like if we brought in the close price here, we would see that the close price started to go back down, but then the moving average or the exponentially weighted mean or whichever smoothing function you're using, it's going to say, okay, this is a, this is a inflection point. And you only know it's an inflection point once you've moved at least one unit forward in time uh, where the price is no longer going up. It started to go back down again. That's how we know that we are technically at a local maximum. And then we have a bunch of features in the background with this model that are informing us uh, that, well, that we've trained this model, you know, based on how we labeled a bunch of, uh, you know, thousands of points in history. Um, 
you know, these are points where we would have wanted to buy. And then the model does what models do. It looks at all the features that are describing the price at those attractive points in time. And it builds, you know, feature importances in this case, because we we're talking about XG boost. It, uh, it identifies, okay, we, we want to make a decision tree kind of process here. And we're going to say, uh, if this, if these features are in the right place, then, um, this is looking like it's going to be an attractive place to buy. So that's where we've arrived at and still need to tweak this selling process and kind of see, you know, now if we if we get the model into a good place where it's making decent enough decisions in a vacuum just about purchasing points and it's making decent decisions in a vacuum just about selling points, we kind of have to see how are these playing out with, uh, you know, combining them. And what I would want to see is something like this where we buy low and then we sell high uh, and, and we just have to get a feel for is this thing consistently um, running in this pattern where it, it buys a low enough dip and sells a high enough trough. Uh, the One of the things looking back at the original system that I built uh, about a year ago that I really didn't like was that it would sell too soon. So let's say that we even had, you could have a perfect model that's saying, you know, let's say we buy at all the right times. But then the problem is on the way up, you can't really tell right here, but uh, but we can see some of these red dots. Um, there are going to be, well, I guess not in this case, I'm a liar. But, uh, but a lot of times what happens is you could barely see it, but there would be technically like a local maximum here, let's say. Like after we bought right here, uh, then you might hit like a local maximum here. Let's see if we go over to the cell, if we can actually see one of these. Uh, no. Okay, well, let's use this as an example. So if you had bought like this dip, uh, then you might see that, okay, this is a local maximum. And if you sell here, that's not really an attractive selling point because uh, the price has only moved a very small amount. And, you know, in hindsight, you can kind of tell that, oh, if we'd held on to that, we could have sold at a much more attractive place. So what this model is trying to do is it's trying to, you know, without benefiting from hindsight, it's trying to say, we're going to be kind of choosy about when we sell. So that if we had bought a dip here, the model's not really going to be in a place where it wants to sell until we hit something like this. And that's going to avoid kind of prematurely selling at any of these false dips that tend to happen. And now in this case, I have a smoothing function that's kind of removing some of that noise of the jagged teeth you might see in a, in a normal price uh, price trend. Like, for example, let's let's just, you know, let's just do this. Let's bring in the actual close price. We'll do it live <laughs> and uh, uh, let's get rid of the zero on our axis. Do not include zero. And you can see what I mean, like the, your actual closing price is really jagged, right? And this orange line that we that we have is that smoothed out price. And uh, and so technically, while you're riding this, uh, this nice bullish run up in price, you have these jagged movements where uh, the price fluctuates and you hit an inflection point. Uh, so the smoothing function protects us from that. If we toss the, uh, the close price out of the picture and we just look at the nice smooth one again, uh, we get protected from those, those jagged swings, all that noise quite a bit, but you still are going to encounter it unless you do your smoothing function, unless you're looking at a time granularity that's kind of more, uh, much more conservative, like let's say a day where, where every one of these data points on the x-axis would have a day between them instead of what we have here, which is about 30 minutes. Uh, the problem with that is then if you make a bad choice or you miss an opportunity, like for example here, you know, we're, we're saying that this was a good point to sell. Well, why wasn't, why isn't this a good point to sell? You know, you might have some missed opportunities here, like uh, this is a good point to sell, but why isn't this a good point to sell? And so the uh, the model, if you're on a if you're on a more granular time frame, uh, of course we're going to miss certain opportunities. You know, the model is not going to be 100% accurate and behaving in exactly the way that would be, you know, the perfect way for a model to behave uh, if we had all the historical data available um, and the benefit of hindsight. Like we're going to miss some of these opportunities. And so if you trade on a more granular time frame that's still producing decent changes in the price, like here we're swinging from a 1.05 up to a 1.6, that's a massive change in price, you know, in terms of percentage of the, the overall price that, that it's moved. 
Uh, this is something where you have to find that optimal, or you don't have to, but you would want to find that optimal balance between, um, you know, or if we make a bad decision, how long does our our system have to wait before it gets a chance to make profits again? And so for me, that's around somewhere between 15 minutes, 30 minutes, or an hour between the, the time frames. Um, but, uh, but yeah, if you wanted to avoid even more of these kind of jagged edges as you roll up the price, then looking at a day or a six hour time interval might even be attractive. Uh, so anyways, gonna get off my, uh, my preacher block, uh, my soapbox about that. And we can see maybe for a couple other symbols, like here's uh, basic attention coin, but you know, how's the big dog Bitcoin doing? And I, I like to see this because something that happens if your trading system's not good at handling uh, when the price is on the decline, like here, if we drew a line of best fit, you know, you'd be, you're sliding down in price. And ideally your trading system is still gonna be making you profits even if you're sliding down in price because if it's good, it could, it could identify decent entry points into the market. Like, let's see if we look at Bitcoin, uh, where would this thing be wanting to buy? It turns out, okay, it's not buying at all. So that's actually, you know, I guess that's fine. This is the trading system as it exists right now is saying, eh, we're on a downward slump. Let's not buy yet. Let's wait for this thing to kind of flatten out. Uh, so I'm fine with that. But if we were buying, you can see that the, the system's also saying, hey, just in case we bought, here's some areas that seem like attractive points to sell. Let's, uh, you know, as we move down this thing, let's check if we have any open Bitcoin orders that we've bought into in any of these dips, we would want to sell at these peaks. So that's Bitcoin. Then let's just see how Ethereum's doing. Uh, we can see that again, we're, we're pretty nicely picking up on the, the peaks that we would want to be selling at. This one, you know, there, there's just one of those things where you have a kind of missed opportunity, but you know, that's the, that's the cost of doing business. I would still be happy if we bought here and we sold up here uh, and likewise there. So then we could just compare that to the buying points for Ethereum and we could just see this one doesn't like Ethereum, the bot's not buying Ethereum. And you know, at this point, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna say, and now it's looking, we've seen Bitcoin, it's not wanting to buy Ethereum, it's not wanting to buy, uh, you know, is this thing ever buying? And the answer is yes. And this is another thing we have to consider is that uh, we want to build the system to be smart you know, we only have a certain amount of resources that we can have in the market at any given time because I'm not a gajillionaire. Um, and so we before buying into uh, what the model says might be an attractive entry point into the market, we might want to evaluate which of the trading symbols available to us has the most volatility. So that's something I'm going to do so that we could see, like, for example, a swing in price where the maximum swing goes from 4,000 up to 4,800 almost, um, that's not necessarily even the most attractive thing to buy into. So the model's picking up on that, you know, based on all the data it's been trained on, uh, a lot of the points that we've marked as really sweet spots to buy in, the price would be swinging a lot more than what we see here. And so it's just deciding to pass on buying in here because the, you know, the odds of buying in and then the, the price not going to an attractive point are just too great for, for the system according to this. But let's see how we do on uh, some other symbols. Okay, so Litecoin, uh, we are buying in at various points down the slump. And then if we go to sell, let's see if we're selling anything on Litecoin as we move down. So here's an example of how, you know, if we evaluated uh, which symbol we want to buy into, uh, even though Litecoin's on a downward slump in this time frame, we see that the, the system would pick up on potentially some attractive places to buy and then to sell. So if you bought this dip as we saw over here, well, there then the system would have sold over here. So uh, that's pretty much all I wanna show about the, the visual kind of feedback. And I do also wanna point out that you know, in the in the coming week, coming weeks, I do want to also start shifting focus over to the another practical thing that needs to exist in the system, which is the actual interaction with the exchange for placing orders, uh, logging those orders, and then um, you know, anytime you if you have the system running in the cloud on an infinite loop, basically. We, we, we need to open orders. We need to track how many slots we have for that particular symbol. 
uh, so we don't overbuy something, you know, waste all our resources on a, on one symbol, for example, or not waste, but invest, you know, over invest ourselves in one niche of the market. So we'll have slots that kind of restrict how much uh, the system is going to buy into any given um, symbol and time frame. But then we want to be able to loop through and just execute buy orders. So what I'm working on right now is we have this function that's uh, that's just going to execute a, a new order. This is going to buy some token on the exchange and it's going to execute that with a fill or kill kind of uh, state of mind, which means that if uh, the amount and the price that we want to buy is available and can be filled immediately, then the order will be filled. If not, then it's going to cancel itself. So we can see down here, uh, I'm going to uh, make a connection to the exchange and I'm going to really quickly scan the prices so that I can put in a really ridiculous kind of price nobody's going to want to uh, bite on. Um, and so we can see the closing price of MANA USD is around three and a half dollars per token. So I'm going to say, hey, I'd like to buy for two dollars per token. Nobody's going to sell that to me. Um, well, maybe they will, but uh, I want to buy one mana uh, USD, so one mana token, and uh, and then I want to buy it for two dollars. And we're going to see that when I run this, the exchange says uh, this thing has been canceled because it could not be filled. So, you know, no one wanted my my crazy offer, and uh, <laughs> the system just immediately rejected it because this order couldn't be filled immediately. Now, this is important because this is how I want the bot to operate. If you just order a, a regular buy order, um, like maybe it's called a limit order or whatever, or a market order, then that thing could just live for a while. It might wait around trying to get populated and that adds complexity into the system because uh, then you have to constantly check on your orders that are open and say, hey, has this thing been filled yet? And it will get filled in different stages and it's just uh, a mess that I don't wanna deal with. So the way that I go about it is I want to, offer a price that's attractive enough to the market at the time that it that it will get filled immediately if I want to buy in. And I don't care if I overpay by a very slight percentage. Uh, it's worth it to me if I can just place an order and it immediately gets filled. And then I can log that into, uh, into my database. And then I basically, what became, what was a buy order now becomes a, hey, here's an entry in the database that's saying, we are waiting to sell. We are waiting to close this trade. Here's the price that we bought it for. Here's the amount that we bought it for. Once we hit profitable conditions, we now have a line item in a database that we can say, oh, we have uh, we have unfinished business here. We need to close out this trade. Uh, and if the prices for some reason just completely tank and that thing never swings up to profitability again, then I also have a, a database kind of uh, I could reference and I could say, um, I'm going to force to sell these at a loss, and now I know exactly how much I lost, and that's gonna help me during you know tax season and all that stuff, but also help me to know how much, am I actually making money, or am I, when I lose, am I losing bigger than when I win? So you can adjust your strategy accordingly. Uh, okay, so we said a lot, and uh, I guess I already mentioned what I'm gonna be working on in the coming weeks. Gonna be in parallel kind of labeling more data sets, so we can see out here that uh, if we look at our actions, you know, there's always all these potential points of interest for the buy side and for the sell side. And I'm still not done going through all the possible combinations of the, the symbols available and the two different uh, or multiple time frames that I'm interested in. Uh, and, and just taking all these points of interest and labeling them. So I have a really nice, you know, supervised learning model. It's trained on a lot of uh, data points that kind of reflect historically what I've wanted to buy or sell here. Now that does take quite a while, but you know, um, it's all about the features. So if I, if I were to do some garbage labeling in here, if I tried to automate that, you know, there would be a lot of points that I might not actually want to buy at, you know, is this really a dip I want to buy? Probably not. So I do want to buy something like this. And so I want the system to be smart enough to be able to pick up on that. So you do kind of, at this point, I still have to put a human eye to that labeling process to make sure that uh, the system is gonna be smart enough to actually be profitable. Not like the dumb system I built a year ago. All right, so hopefully this is interesting to uh, some of the other data nerds out there. And I will be back for another update next week. 
So see you around.